is give you a variation today on a theme about why literacy is important economically, what the problem of literacy Im implies for Canadian economic performance, and what it would cost to fix the problem. This is a little different than we've seen before because literacy organizations and believers like me have spent a long time trying to convince people on the moral imperative for investing in literacy. So I'm going to give you a slightly different take. And some of the data is as new as 12.04 this morning, so you're getting fresh analysis. My story starts with John Kenneth Galbraith, who in 1958 wrote that literacy was the single most important determinant of economic performance, way more than ports or railroads or bridges. And since then, people like me have been trying to prove him right. But I'm going to start with a different set of numbers, because this will become clear how I think about literacy and I think how you should think about literacy. Our species, Homo sapiens, survived 194,000 years without literacy. Most of the important things we invented or adopted, like fire, like civilization, happened before we had literacy. So it's not a panacea. For 6,000 years, we've had something called a printed word, and the people that invented it thought it was useful for a variety of things, including commercial transactions, moral instruction, and, um, and passing on culture. Okay? That's from a, a papyrus from 6,000 BC in Egypt. A hundred years ago was when we started to get significant portions of the population that had literacy. And 25 years ago, almost to the day, it was the first time we had the technology to measure literacy in adult populations. So we haven't been able to know about this scientifically for very long. And it's only 15 years since we've been able to look at how literacy trends are evolving. So that's context to keep everything that I'm going to say in the right context. I've been making a lot of these kinds of presentations and I'm going to start with my recommendations because the policy prescription I give has three parts. First and foremost, we need to adopt policies and programs that increase the demand for literacy skill. You're going to see scary numbers that imply that a lot of the literacy skill we create, in fact, doesn't get used. And that's a huge economic penalty and a social shame and a punishment for the taxpayers that paid for the literacy creation in the first place. The second thing we want to do is to increase adult literacy skill levels because even though we're not using the full supply of literacy, a lot of people don't have the literacy skills to do the jobs they're in. And so we need to invest in adults. And the third thing that I rail about is we still have a problem with the qual literacy quality of kids leaving the secondary system. And that causes problems in the post-secondary system and for those low-skilled kids later on in life. So a play in three parts. I expanding on this, this is my why, do we, why should we care from a public policy point of view about literacy. The first one is simply greed. Economic theory says that literacy skill is an important determinant of economic growth and that literacy shortages or deficits impede the rate of productivity growth and overall economic growth. So if we want to get richer, we should invest in literacy and remove whatever barriers there are. Now there's a couple of sub-themes in here that we have to keep in mind. There's a big fight about whether supply and demand are in, in balance or not. And if they're not in balance, that's a problem economically. This plays out with, oh, we have a lot of jobs for people working in McDonald's or Tim Hortons, so what do we need literacy for? And I say, bullshit. The, the second thing is, 
a little more colorful yet, it's that the road to economic success is paved with PhDs. And there's a lot of action in the post-secondary institutions. Nova Scotia has the highest number of post-secondary institutions of any province in the country per capita. And in the research and development industry that are begging for federal and provincial dollars to subsidize themselves. And I believe that the road to economic nirvana is paved at least as much by the skills of the average worker. And that's a story that I'll repeat uh, throughout today. The second important theme is that we think of the labor market as a market. It allocates resources, workers to jobs. We also think of the health system like that, that it doles out health goods and services to some people and not to others. Our education system works like a market in that some people get access and some don't. And finally, our social and democratic system works like a market in that some people get access to power and influence and others don't. Now, all of those markets function, I call them savagely efficient machines for selecting and rewarding people with skill. That's great. They're very economically efficient, but socially they're a disaster because they leave people behind that have low skills. And in the, to the extent that we're worried about fairness and at least containing those inequalities that result from those markets operating, we want to do something about literacy skill inequality. And we have lots of it. The third one, uh, I'm, my family's all from Nova Scotia. We're from Scottish origins and we're tightwads. And so we want to get the most out of our tax dollars. So this is my parsimony argument. We pay for our health system and our education system largely with public dollars. And the return we get on that investment depends on how literate the population is that's being served. So we have a selfish interest. We could either get more out of the same tax investments or, God forbid, we could cut our taxes and get the same amount out of a reduced uh, take. So we have self-interest, self-interest, and self-interest in raising literacy levels. This next slide is all about why we need to care more now than ever. First and most importantly, Nova Scotians, Canadians, in every province except Quebec, aren't having kids. We're below replacement rates. And so the skills of the labor force aren't going to change fast because that takes demographic change to drive changes in skill levels. And so one of the things I say is it doesn't matter how skilled the kids are, they could all be perfect. They're not going to make the skills available to the labor market fast enough. The next things here are, are slightly different. They have all to do with changes that are happening in the global economy. The first thing that's happening is you can now sell anywhere in the globe, where before you could only sell to other provinces or the US or maybe Europe. Now the markets are huge, and so the potential profits are huge if you can compete. The second side of this is that um, Markets for the inputs to production, technology, high-end human capital, the rocket scientists, and uh, financial capital are now all available on global markets. So someone sitting in Singapore or India or China can get out all the same inputs at the same price. And what this does is allow them to compete with us on price, which they've always been able to do because our wages are higher than theirs, but now they can compete on quality. What this means is we will lose jobs. It's not a question of if. We will lose jobs to those competitors. The key policy question is, do we have the skills to replace those jobs? 